Craig, why don't you flip on to the first chart and let's start talking about what flows actually mean. So flows are basically just describing the buying and selling that's happening within the stock market. Um, so you could think of capital flows as every time you buy a stock, you're injecting money into the market. And every time you sell one, you're pulling it out. So there's there's generally two types of uh, flows that are driving the equity markets, and that's discretionary flows and systematic flows. And discretionary flows are um, based on like the personal assessment of individual investors. So if Apple comes out with earnings and you think those earnings are going to be bullish for Apple, you buy Apple uh, and you create a flow in, in those transactions. So the other kind of flow is systematic flows, which where uh, a bulk of our research is focused on. And systematic flows track um, kind of machine driven buying and selling based on uh, systematic strategies that are rules based and often driven by computers uh, and quants. So the easiest way to think about flows and how this is different than the traditional model, and it certainly is something that has taken me you know, down a path that is very, very different. A flow literally just means a transaction that's occurring between any two individual participants in the market. It can be a value investor deciding that a stock has gotten too expensive and deciding to sell it. That means somebody else has to show up to buy it. That transaction has historically been largely ignored in the analysis of financial markets because it was presumed that markets were informationally efficient. In other words, they were very focused on the idea that the flow of information caused a thoughtful reevaluation of the individual fundamentals of each individual company. And as you guys have probably noticed, nobody really talks about that anymore, right? We talk about what the S&P did, or what the NASDAQ did, or what the Magnificent Seven are doing. Nobody is really sitting there saying, well, you know, when an NVIDIA reported these earnings, this is what I saw on the earnings line that really captured my attention and caused me to transact. The simple reality is, is that people are being forced into these participation, whether it is because of a quantitative type model or whether it is because they're in an industry group as a manager, but as you guys know, and you've heard me talk about over and over again, there's fewer and fewer active managers. I'm a dinosaur in that world, for example. There's more and more systematic strategies that basically treat the market as if it is there to deliver a certain return based on some factor component. So one of those factors that we talk an awful lot about, Craig, is volatility itself. How does volatility affect flows? So when we talk about these quant funds, um, what we're really looking at is things like volatility control funds, which are in the insurance space. Uh, we talk about CTA funds, which is a commodity trading advisor, uh, the trend followers. And then we also look at funds um, that employ a risk parity strategy. So what all of these three strategies have in common is volatility. They are all volatility based. And what I mean by that is they decide their risk allocation and position sizing based on how volatile uh, certain assets are. So can you give me a really simple example of why somebody would choose to do this? Sure, so we could look at vol control funds um, specifically, and we'll, we'll dig into some of our models in a little bit later in this presentation, but uh, a vol control fund looks to target a specific level of volatility within the portfolio um, to avoid any significant drawdowns should some big volatility spike or volatility cluster happen, uh, like we saw in 2020 with COVID. So uh, vault control funds in particular are very focused in the insurance space um, to hedge out some risk and get some market exposure through things like variable annuities um, and some term life insurance. And these funds need to have uh, market exposure but they also need to have that equity um, somewhat liquid. So they have to avoid things like a big drawdown if they're going to have to pay out something like a uh, variable annuity. Well, and this would be a, a perfect example of how markets can change themselves, right? And so if I think about the dynamic of why those types of models emerge, it was under this idea of persistence, right? And so we're all familiar with the expression that markets take the elevator up or the escalator up, but the elevator down, right? Or the stairs up, but the, the elevator down. That ironically is something that feels increasingly untrue in this world. And part of the reason is actually the growth of these types of strategies. So if you have strategies that de-risk 
when markets become increasingly volatile, as things become more uncertain, they can participate in forcing the market down. But once they're out, they aren't actually there panic selling at the bottom, right? And so we tend to see this dynamic of dripping and then a little bit of cascade. And then once they're done selling, they're out.